Good morning. Welcome to Minnewaska Lutheran Church. You're welcome in Christ's name. Today is the third Sunday after Easter, so we're still in that Easter season, a season of, of rejoicing in what Christ has done. Several announcements to be made. As always, we have Coffee Fellowship after church. If you want to help out with that, there's a sign-up sheet in back. It's always good to um, catch up afterwards. I know we all kind of just get here right away, right before the service, and there's not really any time to talk too much, and so staying afterwards is that, that uh, good time where we can catch up and, and continue uh, the fellowship time. Other than what's listed in your bulletins, are, is there anything else that needs to be mentioned specifically? If nothing else, I'll just go through what we're talking about in the service. So the sermon text is also in the book of Acts, uh, as it was last week. But this is actually before. This is chapter 3, and it's right after a miracle of healing. So that's the context. Uh, a guy gets healed by Peter and John in the name of Christ. And then there's a sermon, a mini-sermon. So it's a sermon on a sermon. That's, that's what today is. Um, and if there's nothing else uh, to... To mention as we start the service, um, we'll, we'll start with our opening prayer. Please join me as we begin. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that you will open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the teaching and preaching of your word we may be taught to repent of sins to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. Our opening hymn is uh, hymn number 424. I'll invite you to rise for the final verse of Come Unto Me, Ye Weary.
Together as a congregation, let us confess our sins before the Lord. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you with thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by the Holy Spirit, Increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And if this is indeed your sincere confession, and with penitent hearts you earnestly desire the forgiveness of all of your sins, for the sake of Jesus Christ, God forgives you of all of your sins. And by the authority of God's word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you that God, through his grace, has forgiven all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. And now we'll invite our scripture reader for today's lessons. The first lesson is from Acts chapter 3, verses 11 through 21. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by your own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God himself raised him from the dead. We are a witness of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, the man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what had been foretold through all the prophets saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. The epistle is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, he shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. 
No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Here ends the readings. I invite you to rise for the reading of the gospel text this morning. Today's gospel lesson comes from... Uh, The Gospel of of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 to 49, reading in our Lord's name. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why uh, do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The Gospel of the Lord. You may, or uh, actually, we respond after the lessons. We always respond with a summary of what we believe about what was read. So together we confess with the rest of the church on earth, whoever is confessing this, we confess our faith in the words of the, or the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified at I am buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the lasting. Amen. You may be seated. And now I'll invite our ushers to come forward so we can serve God with our gifts and our tithes.
You may be seated. And now I'll invite any young people to come forward if they want to. I have something to show the whole congregation. They get a better look. What am I holding right now? What do you think this is? Have you seen one of these before? It's a bag. Yeah, it's a backpack. I found it at a garage sale. I bought it from an ex-hippie uh, who used to, he used to take this bag all around Europe. And you see how, how this thing can get super large, and it's just one big giant uh, compartment in there. And so you can stuff this thing with all sorts of, of neat things. I don't know, a, a tent, uh, uh, any gear you need for long, like he would go there for six months at a time walking around and living out of this, all your belongings in here. Um, have you ever walked with a pack like this all day long? It makes you so tired. It's awful. It's not fun. You have to set down your pack and you have to take a break, right? So in today's ser uh, sermon text, there's a word that is used that's it's refreshing. That's what it's called. It, the word is refreshing in English, but it, it pictures you taking off the backpack after a long day. Ugh. You know, when you get home from vacation, like, that's what it means. It means to have some breathing space. Um, you know what? We all carry a backpack of sorts. We all carry burdens. And so this is what sin is. Sin, sin is like an invisible backpack, and it just weighs us down, right? And we can't take it off. That's the problem. This is what Christ does for us. So Christ is the one who can actually relieve you of, of that heavy burden you have, right? We all have baggage. We all have problems. And we all need Christ to, to take that away from us, right? So that's in today's sermon text. Um, there is a, a time where we recognize our need for Christ, and that's called repentance. And then Christ freely takes that burden away from us, all right? So that's what, that's what Christ does. Christ is like a relief from all the weight that may be weighing you down, right? So think of that whenever you, you take off your backpack next time, how Christ does that for you. He gives you that rest you need. So let's pray and, and then uh, move forward. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are the one who relieves us from the burdens that we face in this life. Help us to, to turn away from, from all that is, is evil in our lives and to trust in you. Help us to uh, find relief only in, in you. Uh, we ask your blessing upon the rest of this time that we get to share with your people. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. And now we'll continue with, I, I, I thought of some hymns that are, are comforting. There's that picture of, of peace and relaxing. And so our, uh, our next hymn will be When Peace Like a River. <coughs> Thank you. 
Please join me in a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, the words that have been spoken in your presence of your people are, are your words. And your word is truth. We ask that you would sanctify us in your truth. Create in us what you desire to accomplish. May the words from my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable unto your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer, our tower of strength, and we trust in you. Help us now as we listen to what you have to say to us. In your name we pray. Amen. What God says is more important than what we see. All right, keep that in mind throughout the message today. What God says is more important than what you see. The people in this text, they saw a miracle happen and they were distracted by it to the point where they didn't they were they didn't care what God said. They were just focused on what they saw. It's in our nature to follow powerful figures, to gawk at spectacles. And God, above all people, he's the most powerful figure. And of course, he created everything, which is the greatest spectacle. And yet, we like to substitute God for something else. We like to fill that void with something else. The people of Israel, they heard the prophecy of, of the Messiah... Uh, as a suffering servant, even in the book of Isaiah, makes it very clear that this, this Messiah would be a suffering servant. But they refused to follow him when he appeared before them because they were seeking power and glory on their own terms. They were letting their eyes rule over what God said. What God says is more important than what you see. So I'm following along this text, and, and this is a, a basic sermon in miniature that I'm going to expand upon, but you can follow along in your bulletins in the color uh, outline here. Peter opens up by reminding the people of their heritage. He invokes the, the names of the patriarchs. or That's who God is, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. These were the original, I guess, forefathers of the Israelites that carried the promise of God that through them, through their offspring, the whole world would be blessed. And we find out in Galatians that this offspring was talking about one person, Jesus Christ. And so, but that's who they are. The people of Israel were, were the, the, they had the honor of, of uh, hosting this promise. And now, we carry that promise forward. We carry the words of salvation in our hearts, in our minds, in our lips. And so you have a great heritage too. So he, Peter, opens up his, his message to these people, reminding them who they are. They are people of God. And you too are people of God. You are people of the gospel, which is why we gather here, because of what Christ has done for us. We are defined by what God says, right? What God says is more important than what you see. We like to define ourselves by what we see in the mirror, but we have to listen to what God says about us. And we are primarily people of the gospel, his mission. And then God is still in this mission of spreading the gospel to the whole world, and we're a part of that. Uh, we're a part of this blessing that Christ is giving the world. But, of course, there's a problem in this text, and the problem spills over to today, too, is that the people refuse to acknowledge Christ as the Messiah. The text says, they denied the holy and righteous one. They killed the author of life, which is ironic. So remember, when they, they arrested Jesus, they had the opportunity to let him go, and they released a murderer instead. They killed the author of life, the one who brings life, and they released a guy who killed people. Very ironic. But people loved the world more than God. Uh, and, and that's, that's our temptation, too, to love the world more than God, and that's the reverse of what God intended. So what the people of this time, what they saw with their eyes was more important than what God said. The modern example of this, of loving the world more than God, 
I've been reading about this, and it's been happening a long time, but it was spelled out in the 70s. There was a French guy named Derrida, if you ever care to know about this French guy, if you want to look it up. But he invented a, a he coined the term deconstruction. And you can imagine in your head, you're, you're taking apart something. So basically, his goal was to deconstruct what uh, has a long-standing Christian tradition in Western civilization. We have a strong view of marriage and the family. Um, and, and he basically sought to tear that apart and pursue, um, I guess, I don't know, sexual freedom or, or things like that to do whatever you want. And the way he went about it in his philosophy is to attack grammar, words, right? You take away meaning from words, then you can do whatever you want because there's no authority behind those words. And so um, many people have left the faith today because they, they want to, or maybe they had a bad experience, or they just don't like what Christianity teaches. And so they deconstruct it. They're like, well, maybe the word says, maybe it means this instead. They don't, they don't like who God is or what he says. They would rather obey the trending ideas of the day instead of the timeless word of God. And this is nothing new. This deconstruction thing is just the modern way of, of describing what has always gone on in our hearts. Right? Adam and Eve. Satan comes up to him. Hey, did God really say that? Right? He's trying to put doubt in what God has said. Derrida, this French guy, he hated how repressive religion was. And so he attacked the building blocks of it, and that is language. God is a God of language, of words, of logic. That is something that makes sense. He created us to be able to understand each other. Anyways, this is the, this is the guy who set the groundwork, a lot of it, for the mess we find ourselves in, in today's kind of chaotic moral landscape. Right? Everyone's seeking a moral authority, and they're, you know, you got people looking to all sorts of figures to ground their, be their moral compass. But all these random moral compasses, they're, they don't agree together, and they're often contrary, and they, they're going to fall apart eventually. A lot, of, a lot of them are just self-help gurus or anything like that. We need someone who is stable who is timeless, and that can only be found in God, our our moral compass. And so the problem back then was disregarding what God said. They disregarded the prophets. They wanted someone else instead of Christ. They disregarded the word of God. They let their eyes override what God's word said. And so every generation, that generation back in Peter's day, our generation today, we have to recover a strong theology of Scripture. So one of the, one of the big um, downfalls of the last century, especially in, in larger denominations, has been the claim that the Bible contains the Word of God. It's just, but it is the Word of God. Big difference. And so when they, when they just made that little switch where they said the Bible contains the word of God, um, there is, you know, there's a few verses that are like, well, that's not true, okay. And, you know, you see how subjective it can get. And it just so happens that the, the verses they deny happen to go along with the cultural trends of the day. Seems kind of sketchy. Seems kind of uh, convenient for them, right? 200 years from now, culture might be concerned about something else. Does therefore, does that make it Other parts of the Bible not true? You see how one word can make all the difference. Either it is the word of God, or it's not. And if it's not, we're wasting our time. We could be doing other things Sunday morning, right? But if it is the word of God, we are being fed, we're being nurtured, we're being pointed back to the right way of how to live, who to trust in, how to have hope, and and to be forgiven, to have the burdens lifted in us. And so... In order for that to happen, Peter tells the, tells the people flat out they have to repent of their ways. They have to realize what they're doing. If you're, if you're going down the wrong path, before you can turn around, you have to realize you're on the wrong path. 
think of this in terms of spiritual warfare. And I want people to recognize, and this is, this is a book I'm reading on, on deconstruction, on kind of the stuff that's going on in our culture. Think of this whole um, deconstruction thing I mentioned as spiritual warfare. When we think of spiritual warfare, we, we often maybe think of just praying and, and there's demonic spirits out there and things like that, but it's, it's actually in front of you every day by what you're hearing, what, what voices you're listening to on, on the internet, your phones, TV, all the screens, all the talking heads, what are they, what are they doing to your faith? But here, 2 Corinthians 10 it, it changes how we look at spiritual warfare, or maybe what is commonly thought of as spiritual warfare. It says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And so he's talking about spiritual warfare, destroying spiritual strongholds. But he, he kind of defines what it is. He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Spiritual warfare is about ideas and words. Teachings of the world. There are teachings that will drag you away from Christ, make you trust in something else. And then there are words of, of God which encourage you and, and point you towards Christ, the author of life. So you are tempted to believe from a variety of sources that the Bible only contains God's word or is just maybe a collection of good morals when in, in reality it is God's word. Spiritual warfare is a battle over words. And because of the word of God, you have life. You have the forgiveness of sins. You have eternity before you. So if any ideas of the world are taking you away from Christ, all these maybe, maybe false promises of the world or um, distractions, I think we just live in a world of plenty of, of distractions. If these ideas diminish what sin is, what God describes as sin, if it diminishes the authority of Scripture, if it causes doubts in your hearts, then you must stop listening to those ideas. It can be as simple as, a click of a button, or unplugging something, or filling a bad habit with a, a new good habit. We believe what Scripture says. And we believe that even as this was being originally preached, the Word of God had already predicted that Christ would come and save his people. Hundreds of years before that, Isaiah was talking about Christ. We believe in predictive prophecy, right? God can do whatever he wants. He can, he can tell it how it's going to be. He's the Lord of history. And just because we, we didn't start these ideas, like Derrida, I don't know who that is. Uh, I didn't start that idea. But you kind of believe what he taught. All this, he's very influential in our culture, and his ideas have kind of bled down into us. Where we're the lords of our own lives, Words don't matter. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but, you know, but actually, words are what form you. And if you believe that words have no meaning, then who are we? And here we are, right? Everyone's having an identity crisis today. But it brings up in this text that the people acted in ignorance. They acted in ignorance, but that doesn't mean that they are off the hook. It means we've given in to something that we didn't really know um, how bad it really was. But they have the opportunity to return to Christ. And that's what, that's what God is in the business of doing. He's giving us all an opportunity to turn back to him. And God can turn evil and use it for good. All right, so think of, think of Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery, and uh, he was sold into slavery out of jealousy, his it was a very evil thing. But then he told them, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And Jesus was crucified because of the hatred of humanity, hatred that, that resides in our hearts at times. 
but his death meant salvation for the world. And through that sacrifice, your sins are blotted out. And so God can still use people like you and me in this era of deconstruction, right? In an era where words don't have meaning, I think it's going to create a vacuum where people desire that meaning once again. Because you can't live that way. You can't live in a world without reality. You eventually have to face the cold, hard truth of life. But life is tough. We're only here a limited amount of time. Why are we here? And they want actual answers to those questions. And that's what we do. We have these words of the gospel. Remember, we are people of the gospel. We have the answer that people want. And so God will still use you in this era. And when those words happen, when these people are burdened, and they hear the words of the gospel, this is when the times of refreshment come from God. Like I said, that, that, that imagery of the, the bag being just taken away from you, all that, that luggage that has weighed you down, that's what God does to you when he forgives your sins. We all have baggage we carry in our souls. But remember, what God says is more important than what we see. And so we feel weighed down, right? But what, we have to listen to what God says. Where your sins are truly forgiven. It's true, because he said it. We believe in the word of God. Again, the word refreshment means the experience of relief from obligation or trouble. Breathing space, relaxation. Whew. You can take a, take a breath. All right, it's all going to be all right. Peter ends his sermon by saying Christ will one day restore all things. All things will be restored. Again, this was prophesied. Right? Even in the Old Testament, there were hints of this, where God's going to change the whole world back into what it was before sin entered into it. And your eyes don't see this. This hope we have is a matter of faith, something we can't see and the world is falling apart, slowly and surely, our, our eyes are telling us that. You know, if you talk to any physicist, you know, according, according to that science, the millions of years from now, we'll slowly burn, burn out, fizzle out, right? All matter fades away, or heat dissipates, if, to be technical. Um, but God's going to put everything back together again. And that's what God says about the matter opposed to what our eyes tell us. And so you can make any analogy to what you think is going on in our society, but God will one day uh, perfect the world. Christ healed a man in this text. So Peter and John were the ones who, who were there doing it, but it was Christ's power who healed him. So if you read before this text, they say, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk, stand and walk. And this man was healed by the authority of Jesus' name. And this world will also be healed in the name of Christ. God knows what he's doing. He's given us hints of it all throughout Scripture, all throughout the prophets of old. Christ came here to die, and we were responsible for his death. And we are still tempted to listen to other authorities that tear Christ down. And instead, we need to turn around. And fight back against those ideas by filling our minds with the words of truth, of scripture. We have to stop relying on our own strength for our burdens. We have to lay them at the feet of the risen Christ and trust in his mission to restore all things. So remember, you are people of God. You are people of the gospel. You carry these words of salvation in your hearts, in your minds, and on your lips. No other words in the world are as important as those words. They heal. They lift burdens. They give refreshment. And one day, God's going to use his word through Christ when he returns to restore all things. And so now, knowing all this, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.
we have reason to rejoice, and as we uh, come to a close of our service, we uh, express that in this hymn. This is hymn number 248, On Our Way Rejoicing. We are people of hope. I invite you to stand for our closing prayer. Lord God, in your presence we find fullness of joy, and by your right hand, Jesus Christ, you win and deliver peace forevermore. In the midst of this world's sins and sorrows, give us peace in the knowledge of his salvation and confident hope in the resurrection of the dead. Lord, you have made us your children. You've gathered us into your holy church. Sustain the, the preaching of your holy word and its message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Help this to be accomplished in all the nations of the world. We ask that you would give us your peace, Lord, uh, in our homes and enliven our homes by Christ's re resurrected life. Let the forgiveness of sins reign among husbands and wives, parents and children. Assure those that live alone, that they too are your children, upheld by your right hand. Uh, God of all comfort, you have compassion on all those who are afflicted, and we remember today uh, numerous people in our hearts that are uh, in your need of your mercy. We pray for Eric, Katie, and Ella Disrude, Sam Rom, Jeff Moan, Peyton Lannis, Bonnie Devick, Gary Eckel, Monica Wasin, Tim Flum, Bill Bump, Shelley Larson, Ingrid Ward, Glenny Auberg, and any, any who have recently lost loved ones that are, are dealing with grief right now. Lord, we pray for uh, your protection over those who serve our country. We pray for Lance Wasin and Christian Dodds. And we, we pray also encouragement and protection for our missionaries, Steve and Glenda Qualley, uh, missionaries Brent and Emily Ron, and missionaries Matthew and Edna Abel. You know every situation and what they need from you, and we we place, we place them at your feet for you to, to take care of. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend for all whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. And now we pray the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Go in peace and serve him joyfully.